Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 592. That is 592 of the Agostino Zynga show. I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may be finding you, wherever this podcast may be finding you on God's green earth. And how am I? doing fairly well my friends as you can tell i've just whacked on a flipping do-rag and i decided to double back on the podcast because i thought the first one was a little bit too dance music heavy and for those of you who don't really care about the dance music sort of stuff i can understand why it can sound a bit boring and the topics like, like we're talking about could be going completely over your head or just under your feet so i thought why not double back and deliver another podcast straight back to back things hopefully you shall enjoy what have I got up to so far? So, obviously, I've got my hair braided in between the time that I recorded. No, actually, I've got my hair braided already when I recorded the first podcast. And then I've also put on a do-rag now. I have a couple more do-rags coming in tomorrow. I actually have four because I ordered, you know, I, I'm, I'm indecisive, so I can't choose. So, I ordered four new silk do-rags that should be coming in tomorrow that I'm going to be using for the next few days to make sure my hair is in tip-top condition when I do end up going out and attending all these parties I'll be attending and just living my life as i do regularly now for the most part when it comes to upkeep when terms comes to braids i'm not the best because i do have a tendency to touch my head a lot maybe it's the um, maybe it's sort of like a an unfortunate habit i have because i've always had big hair on top of my head i've never actually cut the top of my hair my head in a very very long time and maybe a few years so maybe because of that i'm always used to having something that i can kind of wrap my finger around or just scratch whatever it may be so when you have braids it's a bit of a departure because immediately my first action is to always kind of run my finger through my hair and then when there's no hair to run your fingers through you end up fucking up the braids and you fuck out the braids you end up looking like a crackhead pretty quickly that crackhead look that crackhead kind of chic kind of dusty braids look that sort of like jim jones style from back in the day when he was in dipset it doesn't work with me i wish it would work i wish i could look like bad bunny and have like braids that aren't the tightest and just kind of look flat and just kind of look like he's been out all day and they still look pretty good but it doesn't really work on me unfortunately i think you need to have a jim jones and bad bunny kind of a bank account in order to make that kind of work and unfortunately my account isn't up there at the moment but it shall be getting there very very soon Anyway, loads of things to jump into, loads of things to get on and talk about. Why not we jump in straight away and talk about the first thing that I thought I wanted to highlight. And this is something to kind of bring attention to the late, great Virgil Abloh. Um, Drake really honoured him and sort of, um, you know, lifted him up in a and give him an incredible tribute in his new video for Sticky. The song he's got off of his new album, Honestly never mind, And re really, it's a really great tribute because essentially he has... Um, the ability to tap into Mercedes and get himself the Maybach that Virgil designed for them and basically have that in his video. And it's, I think, I forgot what the model is called, but it's basically a Maybach truck, an off-road truck that Virgil designed. Um, I think it's a concept car, unfortunately, because most of these big um, car manufacturers, they have a really annoying tendency to always show you really cool concept car designs. And sometimes 5%, maybe even less than 5% of that concept car design will feed into the actual um ready for production and manufacture and ready for sale type of um car that goes you know on the showroom floor which is really disappointing which is kind of the thing i think that people should give credit to people like um elon musk for or for the team of at tesla whoever you want to attribute the credit to at least they try to create and make cars that look striking and that also look exactly the same as they look from the concert for the initial concept sketch to when they already produced you know mass market because i remember when i was studying product design before that i used to do a lot of automotive build design i think if you if you're kind of if you if you're somebody that's interested in industrial design if you're somebody that's interested in product design in general i think for the most part you've always had a bit of a time in your life where you maybe got into automobile design and i used to like to draw to draw cars but for the most part my main thing that i really liked to draw was interiors i was all about interiors and even until this day when i walk past a certain car i always check out the interior see how it's finished see the lines on it the paneling the shapes the textures it's something that still kind of gets me to this day but i remember 
back then one of the kind of sad things about it is that you kind of you know for research purposes you'd go to all these different design studios and you see all these amazing really eye-opening thought-provoking striking incredible um flipping car designs from all these different design studios from all over the world who pitched ideas to you know name the name the flipping car manufacturer out there and zero of those cars are in production none of them went into production none of them maybe an element went into production maybe they took the head lights off of one you know the the way the car the, the, the head seat rests is, is the shape of that they may be implemented in one car or the lines on this whatever it may be but the overall shape and the overall design of the car was never implemented in a production car which is why i give credit to people like tesla because at least stuff like the cyber truck you know like your lump it it's going to end up looking like one of the most striking cars you'll ever see on the road the same thing goes for the road so when that initially comes out and even the model s i mean the lines on that are incredible you see a model s outside and usually if you're into cars you could spot that from a mile off in you know, because how it looks the shape how it sits on the road it's absolutely incredible and i really did think the maybach truck that um virgil up you know designed was really credible before he passed away unfortunately it's an incredible car and i really do hope it does come out in the same vein as his g-wagon that he made that was all white and looked like it was made of clay and stuff it was absolutely amazing like it, it obviously looked real it was, obviously i think they made it kind of real but the way they finished the paint on it, it made it look like clay um it made it look like putty or something and this is kind of the same sort of thing because obviously it finished in brown and this is from drake's video sticky i'm just going to play without the sound of course and i'll show you the pictures but it looks so bloody good man They've done a really good job in it. And I think it's an incredible way to kind of honor Virgil's legacy by having this truck, you know, posted up in the video. Um, Drake obviously doing his thing on that video, Sticky. And the Sticky song as well, absolutely slapping way harder with the video now that we have that in context. I think I mentioned before in it how videos and singles, how singles in general um, hit way different when they come out you know on the whole album i think i spoke about that already with um the break my soul tune from from beyonce and i think sticky is the same thing too sticky obviously was a good track on the album don't get me wrong but it definitely hits way harder now that drake has got this amazing one of one of one car from a late great designer um somebody that everybody had a lot of kind of you know great things to say about somebody that was working incredibly hard who was working on incredibly high frequency whose output is still being felt to this day i remember i mentioned in the previous podcast that Virgil's collection that he did um, honoring David Mancuso the late great David Mancuso the founder of the Loft Parties back in the day um, somebody that people attribute to being one of the very first DJs who you know it, it's arguable but still very in influential you know in kind of spreading dance music culture throughout the world he created a collection with them in for Louis Vuitton that's coming out next year that he already designed. Absolutely wild. And he's, you know, he's flipping presence is being felt to this day. And it's a really, really incredible tribute. I've got to be honest, man. Absolutely incredible. Then we get some closer looks of the Maybach truck itself, courtesy of an account on in Twitter called uh, Drake Direct. I definitely recommend you check that out. This picture here with a little duck walking uh, beside the truck is really amazing. I think this could easily be an album cover. So that's pretty cool to see. The interior of the car looks absolutely absolutely ridiculous i'm not sure if that's a screen where you can play computer games or if that's a screen that i'm sure it's a screen that shows all the um all the you know dials that you need for the car but it also kind of doubles up as a you know edge to edge screen that you can play computer games on and stream movies and stuff on absolutely incredible you've got the maybach sign there on the outside you've got these amazing panoramic windows the kind of oh, look at the lines and the curvature of that like that's just incredible is that where the door handle is there it's a little enamel thing that kind of plops down i'm assuming um you've got the lights at the back there as well that looks incredible man this is a car that they should be putting in production in some way shape or form it has to be put in production like, look look at how amazing that looks that is such a flex pulling up to somewhere like, isn't it and maybe this is maybe a car that was made in light of the cyber truck you know maybe because virgil was around when the cyber truck was obviously revealed this is maybe the lingering effects of designing something like a cyber truck now that manufacturers are going to go out there and actually try and design something that's quite striking it doesn't look like anything else is on the road at the moment um instead of just kind of copying the same sort of shape that everyone has when they kind of put in their cars together and then finally i don't know what that's up. What's that? Why is it sounding here? Okay, I'm gonna stop that for some reason. Damn. Okay, please bear with me. This video noise.
then finally some more images here before we round up things you obviously got drake here sitting on the inside of the car got some images of him here at the back where the where the rear, rear headlights are the scale of it man it's absolutely huge this thing isn't it drake in his mountain wear vibes i'm sitting on the camp chair wearing some mountain boots with a price tag on it still that's a flex in it that's how you know you're rich when you wear mountain boots that are like a thousand plus that are made of some of the best materials you know that you need in order to go and traverse the wilderness but then they still got the price tag on it <laughs> clearly haven't been worn anywhere close to where they should be in terms of the locale and stuff but it's incredible You've got the, obviously the Maybach um, sign too. Oh, you know what's amazing too? The Maybach sign with the nuts and bolts on the on the ridge. If you look closely, they've all been aligned properly, haven't they? In terms of how they're pointing. They've all been aligned really well in terms of the, the top point of that triangle where the Maybach sign is kind of faces that way. And they all point out at a way where they, they're not kind of just done you know, in a kind of haphazard way. They're done in a way where they're kind of pointing down or they're kind of pointing out, basically, on each side that they are. That's the level of attention to detail that you need on these kind of cars because if people are paying close to a million for a car like this, I want to make sure these bolts are, you know, kind of, um, they match in some way in terms of where they're pointing and whatnot. That's really cool little detail that I just noticed. And then him sitting on the inside as well. So the car looks amazing, man. Loads of weird compartments. Oh my God, I like what they did with the seats. Look at the with the seats. I'm assuming he made the seats look like um, what are those um containers people put f uh, like guns in? You know those kind of big cases that people put guns in and shit, or they kind of carry heavy heavy weapon machinery in general, right? Um, they usually boxes that you see a lot of in movies especially sniper movies where the guy's about to take your sniper rifle out it's like a case that you take out it's got foam in it or whatnot and it's pretty sturdy looking and that's what i guess he kind of designed the outside shell of the seats to look like because they look like kind of bucket seats but they've got that sort of vibe on it fuck man looks so good i hope they do an exhibition with this car sometime some sometime soon or maybe when they do the exhibition they kind of take the exhibition that he's got in um, Chicago or the one that's kind of roaming around. And when they do it in other locations, maybe they're going to implement putting some of the stuff, some extra stuff in there, such as the Maybach truck, because I would love to actually see this in real time, in real life, sorry. It looks absolutely phenomenal, man. But yeah, check out the video. Uh, Drake Sticky, it's available now. It's what it's one of his better tracks on the single, on the album itself. I'm still in love with Feelings, personally. I still think it's one of the standout tracks on that fucking album. Um, but yeah, check it out if you haven't already. Moving on, quickly, we have another news courtesy of, of um, another, moving on, we have more news, moving on, we have more news concerning Virgil Abloh, some good news actually concerning some Futura Dunk Lows that were previewed a very, very, very long time ago. Now, me personally, me, me personally, I would like to say that I played some part in this Virgil Abloh and Futura connection. Now, I know it's a bit far-fetched. I know people will laugh at me and think I'm absolutely talking out my ass, but I really do think um, I played a little, a little, a little game in them kind of getting together. And the reason why I say that is because when I was working at this really cool online um online fashion learning platform i was in charge of putting together the streetwear course which i've obviously spoken about and featured on my youtube channel and i've spoken about on a podcast a few times and me together with another guy we were basically in charge of co-producing that that program and we essentially you know went out and reached out to um we went out and reached out to all of the lecturers i did anyway in terms of signing them up and making sure they wanted to be on board um and with that, we were able to basically fill up the, the, the program around Virgil because at the time Virgil did, wasn't really comfortable with being the lead kind of lecturer or the kind of curator of the program because at the time, back then, Virgil wasn't really well regarded in streetwear. People kind of felt like he was a bit of a poser. They kind of felt like he didn't know what he was doing. It was a bit lame. There was a bit of a weird thing around Virgil around that time. So he kind of didn't really want to pursue it. But also, I imagine at the time too, he was also probably thinking about his transition into high fashion but he didn't want to do it too quickly and he didn't want to come across like he was just like a culture vulture like he was just taking from the from the streetwear scene 
taking all the juice and then running off to the fashion people like most people do in it when they want to go when they want to kind of pop over there because i guess you know there's loads of girls and there's loads of money over on the fashion side more so than streetwear but anyway that aside um we were able to fill in the course with loads of really great people and i guess virgil's shyness or aversion to being the face of the program was actually a good thing in the end because what ended up happening we ended up having a far stronger course because we had loads of people who probably he felt like and I felt like at the time could lead the course if they wanted to they could be the main curators because they had such heavy rep in the scene they were so well regarded they had incredible CVs they done great work back in the day with their own brands or brands that they were currently running and they just almost smashed it one of the main people that was also included in there who was a guest lecturer and also a, a tutor for some of the brands was somebody like Kyle Eng who now has brain that is absolutely doing great things there so you can just imagine the caliber of people that were designing there and one of the people one of the people that was really there that I kind of worked on to get involved in was Rob Cristofaro, who was, if you're not familiar with, the founder of A Life, the legendary uh, brand. I mean, I'm not sure if you're around, if you know it, uh, brand, A Life brand. I'm not sure if you oh, are aware of it, but the legendary New York brand that was around the time when, you know, a New York thing was out and stuff. And just a legendary, I would say, not even a brand, I would say it's maybe more of a it's more of a platform to express ideas because he does so many different things from terms of hosting parties to doing pop-ups to doing collaboration clothing it's all included right music it's all kind of part of the brand and rob has always been incredibly inspiring i thought to me especially how he kind of conducts himself and kind of keeps himself to himself and just does really cool and interesting work and he's intrinsically in that in my opinion like 100 percent new york everything that he does the way he presents himself the art that he does the graffiti that he endorses it's all 100 percent new york and um i ended up getting him involved in the program i had to persuade him quite vigorously to get involved he didn't have any prior relationship with virgil beforehand and they ended up actually getting along really really well like he flew him out to the show they did the collaboration after the fact um virgil and rob and then i'm assuming this is me stretching here now i'm assuming that that relationship with rob also led with virgil then hanging out with futura because rob and futura rob rob from a life and futura are really close and they also you know really close, but they came up at the same time so they kind of got a real good connection in terms of uh, being in the scene at the same time especially from doing graffiti and whatnot and i felt like that connection that i initially made between virgil and rob was the reason why Futura ended up getting together with Virgil. Now, this could be completely wrong. I could be completely talking out my ass, but I like that story. I like that story for me because I don't usually claim things. I don't usually come out there and say anything that I've done or boast about the things that I've kind of achieved or whatnot, except for the DJing stuff, because I still think that's something that if I do on my own and I succeed, if when I succeed, it's going to be monumental because it's still one of the most hardest professions to make it out there in music or in general, I think in culture, it's really difficult to make it. So if I can make it, I'm going to be talking out there when I can make it, sorry, I'll be talking about it forever. But the Virgil and Futura connection, I feel like is amazing. And if I feel like I played any small part in it, I'm really chuffed and grateful because the finished product of it, outside of what I did in terms of just sending some emails or whatnot, is absolutely incredible. Really, really well done. Especially when you consider Futura's legacy when it comes to dunks. Um, what are they called again? What are they called? Flumes. Was that what they called? Flumes. Futura, uh, Futura Dunk High. Was it Flume? What was it again? Is it Flume? Or am I mistaken? Is it Flom? Do you remember these from back in the day? Futura, um, Futura Laboratory Dunks. So he's got an incredible legacy when it comes to dunks. I remember these because these were the Livestrong ones that are actually sold in the store I used to work in called 1948 in Shoreditch. A little trendy sneaker store that unfortunately has closed down, which should reopen in some guys. This is the, in some guys, this is the best time for a store like, you know, 1948 to exist in, I reckon, especially with all the, activations and stuff that go around nike now at the moment they're a lot more social media friendly they're a lot more i feel like they're, they're, they're a lot less stuffy and uptight they seem to be a little bit more carefree in terms of who they're sponsoring who they're kind of um who they're seeding product to you know there's conversations around inclusivity diversity representation blah 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 this is a perfect time for 1948 to come back around hopefully it does in some way shape or form because that store was fucking cool man it was a really cool hangout spot as well to meet and do new and interesting different people but anyway i remember the live strong um futurists because they were that was around the time that i was working at the store they weren't sold at the store but i remember that was around the same sort of time that they existed but these um 
these ones, the FL with all the money uh, notes kind of printed on them were an absolute iconic dunk from back in the day. I'm actually surprised considering all the hysteria over dunks and Nike essentially, you know, bleed, you know, bending over themselves to release every single hype dunk that came out. I'm surprised these haven't come out either, to be honest. But maybe they're trying to, um, you know, maintain the resale value of these because there's a little bit of a double dipping involved in the industry i don't really know who knows i'm just talking out my ass but anyway the dunk loads themselves look incredible they basically build upon what virgil did with his dunks that he released a few what a couple of years ago which now look far better than they they did now they look far better now than they did when they came out the ones that had all different sort of colors and combinations i still don't understand his idea around the different colors and combinations and why he did them the way he did them but still i thought the um the final product was really well done i actually like that i see more people wearing those dunks than i see people kind of reselling them they still resell for high amounts but i see a, i've even seen somebody wear the black and silver ones those dunk lows you remember those ones virtual ablo dunk low black silver those are probably the best the best ones in the whole range apart from maybe some of the white and gray ones you know what i mean um the ones that were kind of whitish and gray but i thought these black and silvers were absolutely phenomenal and then maybe the other second great ones are probably these ones that are like white with silver and then there's another pair that's got this sort of like makeup where it's like white gray and there's another one where it's like kind of a suede on the upper instead those colors are really nice too but the obviously the standout one is these so i've even seen one person wearing these out loud you know in real life they could be fake who cares but the fact that some people are wearing them is fucking incredible and it goes to show how how virgil was able to somehow uh, that's just have another talent he did he had that doesn't get spoken about a lot when it came to sneakers especially he had the ability to make things that people are actually wearing to wear or kind of show off um which is really cool um, I don't know how he did that. Really, really did that really, really well. Especially when you can think about it. When I think about it, when I think about Virgil, I don't really think of a sneakerhead. I think more of a kind of a, of an ideas guy. But for some reason, he's able to kind of work it out because I think sneakerheads like Kanye, who's, I would say, more of a sneakerhead, it would make more sense why he kind of gets how to make desirable product because he always desired, you know, Jordans for a certain, certain extent. But I felt like Virgil just always desired kind of being involved. He desired kind of making things and creating a world, not just making a singular product. But I think when you're an adamant sneakerhead, like you look at people like Ronnie Faye and the Joe Fresh Goods guys, like it's no surprise they make great sneaker collaborations because they're always obsessed with fucking you know the minute detail of sneakers like i am in terms of midsoles and foxings and you know outsoles and eyelets and stuff and you know mud guards and flipping what material to use do you use new bug do you use suede do you use mesh do you use patent do you use smooth leather you know all these kind of things i'm kind of curious about but then for some reason Virgil wasn't curious about I, I, not, to not at that obsessive level but you're still able to perform at the highest level in terms of ch churning out these colorways that just all smashed it like every single one was a 9 to 10 out of 10 every single one it's not even it's not even fair how good he was at the, doing those things man but yeah so the dunk loads that Virgil put together were the same sort of motif for the other ones so he's got the safety harness strap things which I just realized aren't actually to say I thought they were just permanently put on but I guess they're actually laced as well so if you want you could just lace them up or take them off which is quite cool but I do like them how they're kind of put on top of them I think it kind of gives them an extra layer and kind of makes them look far more interesting than the regular dunk um so that's pretty nice they have the nylon tongue on there which i am always a bad fan of the nylon with the mesh tongue on there i'm not sure what these little stains are on the little mudguardy bit the little white yellow stains I'm not sure if that's an effect or if that's underneath the actual bit. oh okay it's a it's a sort of what is it what would you call it it's a sort of um effect that you get from spray painting so that's been applied on the whites as well which make them look a bit more vintage but then on the red you kind of see the color a little bit more Oh, it's not actually a nylon. The tongue isn't foam, but it's leather. Interesting. Maybe that might help with the shape when you have when you have it on your foot. That's not, that's the one of the sly annoying things with Nike Dunk Lows I've found. Maybe you get it as well with highs. I'm not really too sure, but I know when you wear Dunk Lows that aren't SBs and the tongue is nylon or whatever, right underneath, it can slip around a lot. And I've never really been a big fan of putting my eye, my laces through the little slit on top of the tongue. I think it always looks a bit, you know, a little bit weird personally for me. Um, but if you don't do that, then the tongue always kind of slides around all over the place. But then the foam tongue is usually the standout thing in my opinion. So it's a bit of a hard thing to kind of balance. But 
those these futurists um and nike virgil dunk lows anyway to kind of c- conclude this because i keep rambling oh the the outsole bloody oh is absolutely amazing i just realized it's all flipping see-through i see soul this is the pinnacle this kind of represents to me something that's you know only someone that was part of the culture and knows what's up would know about because there was a period in time when i was buying shoes in the early 2000s and whatnot when some of the best releases or some of the best limited edition especially the friends and family ones they always came with some sort of icy soul i guess that was the version of that was maybe the equivalent of having your brand named in um what was his name your brand named uh sort of like stitched on the upper of the shoe or your brand name stitched on the tongue or maybe um the insole change it was like kind of it was a little extra feature that not every not a lot of people got it was something that was only kind of reserved for the top upper echelons so with this outsole um detail here with i guess what this what does it say it says futura oh if it, oh wow it says futura and ablo that's amazing so i'm assuming that's futura's hand style and there's virgil's hand style written on the bottom of the shoe which is fucking incredible so these are definitely going to go for a lot of money anyway regardless but the fact that they've got those at the bottom is absolutely insane i've just seen that um so um they're saying here for courtesy of hypebeast that these are going to be released on virgil's Ablo's birthday which is a rumor now but this is pretty cool it says here um thankfully rumor has it that the long awaited off-white future dunk low collection could actually be launching on a late great designer's birthday which is on september the 30th it would be nice to see if people celebrate it online and stuff and kind of honor his legacy by just i might actually do actually by doing like a marathon and watching loads of content concerning um virgin Abloh and stuff and just talking about you know some great memories that i might have from my brief time meeting the guy and it says as far oh look sky galati is the one that posted the actual picture itself okay cool that's another person who I tried to get involved on, on the course but he kind of declined it continued here so the two piece collection was first teased during Paris Fashion Week in 2019 Mamma Mia one iteration of the inspired um, by the University of North Carolina Tar Heels and the other one draws inspiration from the Syracuse Orange Man two powerhouse institutions when it comes to NCS, NCAA basketball so the, the tie there is incredible impeccable futurist signature graffiti style is seen with a spray paint effects that show on the collars our quarters and toe box on the upper as well as through the dunk low lettering um like many have ablo's past dunks the laces are doubled here once again and both pairs are styled with an extra set that's presented in bold orange expect more information is rounding release to arrive in the coming weeks so that's incredible news to hear for those of you who care about that kind of stuff and i do really care so let's try and see if we're able to get them when they do drop moving on from this, this is a really strange one to kind of mention but i thought i had to mention it um this is not really this guy's fault but more so a kind of um criticism overall of sneaker culture and just the way things drop and how things are seeded and marketing it's just annoying for me personally as a somewhat retired and reformed sneakerhead because i've had a real love-hate relationship with the fucking scene and industry it gets on my nerves but i just can't seem to let it go <laughs> or you know every time it kind of draws me back in kind of thing and um one of the things that's kind of really annoyed me within i feel like the last few years it felt like there's been a real kind of upsurge in i would say what would you call them like influence like sneaker influencers right or just influencers in general there's been a real uptick in the amount of them that exist nowadays and i guess if you're a brand you know having learned from gary v essentially you know influencers are really underpaid for what they do because they have a very dedicated fan base of people who for the most part are very involved and into what that influencer does they follow them for whatever reason they want to follow them for a vlog for fashion for inspiration just to look at them wherever it may be so if you're a brand and you want to tie yourself next to an influencer you're essentially guaranteeing that that whole subset of people that follow that influencer are going to be in completely enamored with what you're offering whether it's a car whether it's a toothbrush whether it's a camera or in this case a pair of sneakers but i also feel like these brands what they've done with these sneakers with these influencers is that in order to kind of glitzy up the relationship or to make it worthwhile or to really make it make waves on social media they've kind of done away with just giving influencers shoes early which is what influencers usually used to get which makes a lot of sense because even myself when i was somewhat involved in the scene and i had a little bit of clout from the time i was working at the nike store i was able to kind of you know siphon off a pair for myself when the delivery came in i knew for myself one of the advantages of being tapped in is that you got your pair early 
Now, for me personally, I've never been the kind of person who wants to get a pair early and free. I don't care about that. I think I spoke to somebody recently about it when it comes to like yesterday stuff at clubs. When I go to nightclubs and stuff, my main prerogative isn't to get into free, isn't to get isn't to get in for free. I know some people love to go out to nightclubs just to kind of go out there for free and to kind of get free drinks and hang out and stuff. But I've never been that kind of guy. I'd rather stay at home than go to a nightclub broke. But when it comes to sneakers, I've always wanted the ability to have the access to buy them because sneakers especially limited edition ones for whatever reason they've created this artificial scarcity despite the industry being multi-billion dollar industry probably in the double triple digits now at the moment and despite everyone and their nan knowing about sneakers nowadays and reselling or whatnot they still kind of try to maintain this aura that sneakers are limited and they can't make any more and they do this by basically creating artificial scarcity by purposely only making a set amount and then giving most of them away to influencers and stuff for free to wear. And I feel like it kind of is annoying because instead of just sending them regular pairs to get ahead of time, they sometimes send them shoes that the regular public can't get a hold of. And it's something that's always existed even in my, in my era in terms of friends and family pairs of shoes. But the friends and family pairs of shoes were so limited that it wasn't even bothering getting worried or pissed off that you couldn't get a pair but nowadays a friends and families pairs like this example courtesy of hypebeast regarding zach beer's asics gel keanu 14 collab these flipping friends and families are limited to 200 what kind of friends and family have you heard that's limited to 200 pairs that's a lot of pairs and now these shoes i feel like are really nice i feel like a lot of people will be into them um they're essentially an asics um gel Keanu model with a it looks like a sky blue kind of white upper on the front and then it's got this amazing kind of black mud guard here at the back um or heel sorry heel guard or whatever heel cup whatever you call it here at the back with white laces and it's got this amazing yellow um sort of fluorescent kind of inside bubble going thing and a kind of off-white midsole but essentially the makeup of it is really nice in terms of the color combination he did a really good collab for somebody again who i wouldn't you know deemed to be a sneakerhead he put together a really really nice shoe but yeah whatever it may be this is a nice shoe i would imagine a lot of people will be into it and wanting to buy it but you can't because it's only available for his friends and family but then they're advertising everywhere which is something that i've never understood and really kind of gets on my nerves i get the marketing aspect of it but if you're not going to release it to the public for, for everyone to kind of have a, a chance to buy it why are you showing it to us and why are you putting all this marketing dollars behind it, it just doesn't make any sense unless this is a model that hasn't been released yet and they want to spearhead it by kind of pushing zach beer to do the first calibration and an iteration of this will come out that looks kind of similar maybe that's the case of it but i just find it really annoying you find it a lot with um cactus plant flower market collabs as well that that diamond dunk one that she did that wasn't really available in many places and you see bari wearing it in some terrible outfit looking like he's about to explode from all the flipping fried food he's eating it's just annoying i want to see more people have access to this sort of stuff and it's not just about me it's about everybody in general because i feel like the access to trainers and the lack of access to it is really bizarre the fact that you can buy a limit no, in fact, the fact you can buy like an in-demand iPhone on day of release or on the next day with ease, but then you can't buy a really limited edition sneaker is really retarded, in my opinion. I, I don't care the word, not meant to use it, but that's the only way to describe it. It actually makes no sense to me, especially now that legitimately everybody and their mum knows about sneaker selling. You know, people there's, there's sneaker resellers out there who are under the age of 16, I'd assume now. There's probably 10-year-olds, just, you know, slinging, flipping sneakers to your, you know, to your favourite basketball player out there at the moment this stuff exists people are creating bots they're on discord and stuff whatever it may be it's a big industry now the fact that they can't make enough shoes to satisfy demand is something that will never ever make sense to me ever 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 and the fact that they will purposely make limited edition shoes and then send it to one of the most followed kids out there one of the most clouded up kids out there a kid that most people will kind of know who he's who he is or what his face is and then tend to give it to his friends and then all his friends share it on their social media platform with all the hundreds of thousands and millions of people that they follow but then none of their f fans can actually buy it is a real crying shame it really is this is that the this is like even worse than 
blue balls this is like another level of blue balls now if you go on his instagram you actually see on this kid's instagram stories that he sent them out to all his cool friends that are just doing cool shit with them but there's no one normal quote-unquote person that's got a pair of them everybody on here that's got a pair has either got a tick a, a verified thing next to their name or they're just you know living life doing the greatest of all they want to do like look heron does the thanks bro proud friend like all right it's i always i always find it funny as well like all, all these guys seem to have friends that are doing cool and interesting things they never seem to have like regular friends that they want to promote on their stories it's never talking about your friend that's working as a bus boy never your friend that's working as a bar back never is your friend that's working as a receptionist never is your friend that's working as a nursery teacher it's always your friend that makes cool things that's your friend so proud my friend my friend why aren't you proud of your friend who got given the keys to the retail store that he was that he was um the weekend assistant at the other day why isn't that a proud thing it's always proud about the cool things isn't it this fucking fury infuriating i really find it super annoying but whatever in it like gq articles about it but then you can't actually purchase the thing itself it's absolutely redacted it really really is and it gets on my absolute nerves i hate everything about it but again they keep getting me involved and i can't let go of this shit i really do wish i could let go anyway moving on from that i don't want to get too stuck on that and absolutely get in trouble for it i going to talk about this hopefully it loads up in time can you load for me or are you just gonna be able to keep playing games okay cool there we go so most of you are aware the drake album came out um people weren't that fond of it because it essentially is him doing his version of house music i don't know why he kind of decided to do the house music thing maybe he did go to places like ib for and stuff before making the album maybe he's been listening and checking out clips online like we all have of the whole ama piano explosion that's basically i felt like happened from 20 to 2019 to now i feel like the whole world has finally discovered ama piano or discovered african house music in general and maybe that maybe opened his eyes to finding these collaborators in europe like kind of music like inner visions maybe forward you know he might end up working with them um the stuff he's doing with black coffee is super interesting too but in general in general we are definitely seeing a turn or a shift in culture towards that kind of sound and of course most recently with beyonce dropping her album renaissance we have a lot of house people contributing to that album we have a whole remix album that's basically been done by some pioneers of the house music scene too that are kind of contributing to it so it's clearly something that's happening it's clearly something in the water and i really like this clip of drake um that was featured on adam port's um instagram account and also uh, instagram account sorry and also kind of music crew their sort of instagram account for their entire collective kind of music and it basically features drake popping up in saint tropez where kind of music were doing a label showcase whatever they usually do with all them playing up on there and me ramper and um, adam port and he essentially just enjoying himself having a great time and me personally obviously after the success of his album because obviously ramper worked on it and put some you know some of his stardust all over the album as well and i guess he probably bumped into flipping um, black coffee out there because Sandra pay feels like it's like the new ib for maybe the ib for that hasn't been um, baited up yet but i really liked this i really like this video i really like seeing drake here absorbing this recording all of it on his actual iphone and not recording it to kind of upload onto instagram so it's cool because it means he's going to go back and listen to some of these tracks and feel the vibe and maybe have that feedback into the later stuff he puts out because i still think even though honestly never mind didn't really hit where it meant to hit um i still think it was a good solid attempt for somebody who maybe has only got into house music recently and just wanted to make his first interpretation of it he's only going to get better jeremy he's a genius kind of guy so i'm definitely sure he's going to work it out but for me personally i like this clip because i want to see more black people on the dance floor i know i'm not that kind of guy i don't really talk about representation and that sort of stuff but sometimes when i go out and i go to these kind of events i like to go to techno nightclubs i like to go to you know do my bit of techno tourism i like to go to house nights let's go to disco nights it is a little bit disconcerting when you go out to these kind of places and you don't see more people that look like you because when you consider a lot of the music that they're playing is based on roots that come from black culture right and it's kind of upsetting that it's not really it doesn't really click with our community for some reason i'm not really too sure what the reason is because i still think a lot of artists out there especially black artists who are doing other types of genres if they dabbled in stuff like house music or even djs who are doing other genres if they decided to you know switch 
focus and start doing hard style start doing hardcore start doing i tell a disco start playing techno that absolutely destroy even some black teachers nowadays who used to play grime back in the day who are moving into tech house they're absolutely phenomenal behind the deck so i'd like to see more of them on there and i don't know this is naive but i would like to hope that maybe drake going to Saint Tropez and being so enamored with the house scene over there, people seeing him post what he posted, this clip going essentially viral and people all over the place seeing it will maybe be the push that a lot of people need to kind of be like a bit more curious to be like, you know what, let me just try it and check out this house thing. Let's see what I go on. Cause I want to see more people that look like me on a dance floor. I really, really do. But this is a clip anyway. and big up kind of music too for the production they put into their little label showcase things i really dislike the whole like m many many people behind the dj booth and stuff but i think it does add to what they do because it's a kind of music crew it's free of them um it's always a collective thing it's never about the individual. It's always a team spirit sort of vibe. They have their radio show where they invite many people onto the show to do their mixes on there. I would love to do one hopefully in the future and be have the privilege of being invited to do one also. But they've always kind of been a collective type of vibe. So maybe having a million people behind the DJ booth and it being completely rammed and people's hands in the air trying to get, you know, trying to get their face inside of the camera and shit and have a viral social media moment is a bit cringe. But it also makes sense what they do. And also like the fact that they put it as into the signage and whatnot the smoke machines the balloons it's all kind of really fun and really carefree and kind of is a really big contrast from the events i go to like for instance i'm gonna go to this party in berlin that's put on by a collective called Conceptual. it's a complete opposite of this what they're doing i'm gonna also go to a night um put on by um hair and sauna completely different vibe right it's very black it's very silver it's very jock strappy it's very um you know studded belts and studded collars and shit so to see this sort of vibe is quite nice it's a bit of refreshing in general to have that kind of duality happening in a scene where you have these two things going on and they're kind of coexisting and even in a house scene there is a house type there is a genre of house or a you know a subsect of house where it's all just skinny jeans and you know white t-shirts and stuff and kind of bland and boring music but it's good to see them doing this type of vibe as well there too considering it <laughs> they've turned into honestly I've, I've been following these guys for a while but they've turned into legit rock stars it feels like over the last few years it's pretty incredible to see like the amount of beg friends that are out there in the front of the flipping stage trying to reach out and touch them and just get their attention is absolutely bizarre and again it's, it's a really interesting genre it's a really interesting feel to kind of get involved and i think that's why i'm obsessed about talking about it because it really doesn't make any sense because you're effectively playing music for the most part that isn't made by you there are some teachers out there who only play their own recordings and their own stuff um whatever it may be but for the most part you know people like surgeon and whatnot but for the most part you play music from that other people have put together and you're also only the only thing you're doing only quote unquote is finding out is you're, 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 you're the only thing you're doing is learning how to mix the two records together some people don't and you're also trying to sequence them and make them make sense in a set which isn't that hard if you've got good ear and you've got good taste. It shouldn't be too difficult to figure out. Maybe the technical side of it, of kind of beat matching and shit, and learning how to mix on vinyl and not use the waveform or whatever it may be. All those things are maybe a bit more tricky, but when it comes to having good taste and having to sequence a set or what comes next, what is a good track to start a set with, what's a good track to get people back on a dance floor, what's a good set to kind of end, that you should be able to kind of figure out the more you go out and the more you start to enjoy this type of music. So it's kind of easy. And to get 
to have the level of attention and kind of hype and sort of like fandom that an actual artist who spends time writing music composing it putting it together performing it doing dance routines and shit to have that same level of fandom just because you're pressing q and you're mixing channels and shit is pretty wild but it also explains why dj's egos are all over the place because the love that you get doesn't really match your talent level <laughs> so it sometimes gasses you up do you know what I, mean? I can understand why djs are kind of cunts in for the most part and have a really warped sense of reality and self-worth you know or warped sense of kind of value or whatever it may be i don't know something along those kind of lines similar to like comedians as well because you essentially just get on stage and tell jokes you know i mean anyone can do that um if of course not everyone's funny but anyone could do that so maybe that thing gets involved in it but it's pretty funny to see but yeah they're legit rock stars man the phone thing i always hate there's loads of phones up in the air recording the moment like when the beat drops and shit i find all that stuff cringe and for the most part your video is never going to capture the energy and the spirit and the sort of vibe of the live recording of the live event anyway you're better off just recording a couple of clips so you can have the memories there but then for the most part just enjoy yourself pop a pill have a line um do, do whatever you want to do and just enjoy yourself but the whole recording stuff is really whack and big up adam paul as well he's got these skanks that he does that are really funny and big him up in general that he goes out for the most part sober right he's completely straight edge I don't know how he's able to survive going out and DJing in places that he DJs in because there's a lot of, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, bimbos in this sort of scene, right? In terms of, you know, for for better, for worse, or for better or worse term, like airheads that listen to this type of music, like right? girls wise who just, you know, want to have a good time and just, you know, in it for the Instagram pictures and shit and to show off their outfits. And those type of girls are the ones that are like for Zambukas, you know, when you're while you're DJing and shit. So they're not really the most um well behaved type of people that you want to see when you're, you know, going to play. So I can only imagine how annoying it must be to be around them. And then plus the fellas, the guys around you are trying to, Adam, Adam, honestly, come honestly, I love you, man. You don't know, me. you know, all that sort of shit. And you're completely sober. Oof, what a career. But I guess the the funny skanks kind of helping it. Of course he paints his nails. Of course he paints his nails. Oh yeah, by the way, painting your nails and wearing pearl earrings or wearing pearl necklaces, that's got to be out in 2023. You've got one more year to do that shit. One more year of kind of showing how in tune you are with your masculinity and showing how, like, okay, we get it. It just looks, it just looks lame now. It doesn't even look counterculture. And you know what I mean? Before when you saw someone wearing nail polish, you're like, oh shit, man, he's really like cool. He must be, you know, into cool shit. It's like when you see you're somebody with like paint splatters on their on their on their trainers. You thought, oh, rah, you're a graffiti artist or you're a contemporary artist. Nowadays, you see someone with flipping paint splat all over their clothes. They're probably wearing flipping gallery department. Do you know what I mean? So the nail polish is sort of the same thing. It's kind of cheapened the the counterculture sort of like avant garde punky nature of it is completely gone. It's just normy shit. You got kids online who wear clothes from fucking Primark painting their nails and shit it's like come on man you gotta try harder but yeah last clip here one more okay cool we're not gonna play again but yeah you get it i'm really really hoping that this means that we're gonna have more black people on the dance floor drake is now out there promoting the gospel of house music and spreading it far and wide via his instagram profile and being just you know via just him being him hopefully that happens hopefully that ha that is an occasion that kind of happens going forward that would be absolutely amazing to see i really really would love that but yeah but big up drake for you know going to these parties and enjoying himself and having a world of time and maybe this will spur other black people to get out there and join the dance floor because i've had enough of being surrounded by the whiteies i've had fucking enough <laughs> anyway moving on quickly went to mention um two things number one i really really want this kind of music tote bag it looks really big and it's i love the colors of it it's a you know a regular tote bag but the main 
canvas sides the, the main canvas compartment is yellow with the kind of music logo written in hot pink and the straps are green so that i really like that kind of combo but the main thing i wanted to talk about was this trend that everyone's doing now of these iv drips after you've kind of recovered from a real night of absolutely getting on it and getting absolutely blasted it's kind of lame isn't it especially when all these men are over the age of 30 some of them probably have kids some of them maybe have grandkids i just find it incredible i just find this like this has a lot of dad energy like a lot of kind of dad energy and i don't know why it's become cool because i think it was kind of popularized by dave Chappelle and that lot right that's why i remember seeing it first um, especially within the men's circuit because he would do these tours and invite all his friends along to come and do these shows with him around America I think this might have been during a pandemic or maybe after or in the middle of the pandemic I'm not sure what happened um, but I remember him doing those shows and one of the big things that he would do is that he would hire out these suites in these hotels and have these people come in to do IV drips in terms of getting nutrients or whatnot back into your body after, you know, a crazy night of partying. And obviously you can only imagine what a night of partying would be like with Dave Chappelle's crew and shit included because all those guys are quite you know free especially when Joe Rogan's involved they're free with the tab and they want to get everyone drunk everyone to have a good time and shit so the same thing will probably occur if you're a DJ right you go out and play these amazing events you have a good time you go to the you go to the private after party after hours thing whatever you do you then go back to your own villa and it's just debauchery after debauchery after debauchery right you just have an absolute whale of a time doing exactly what you want and living your life but I don't know if this is the marker of cool. I don't know if kids, it's a strange industry, right? Because for the most part, a lot of the people who are really successful are the ones who are way older than their clientele, you would imagine. Maybe it's different with kind of music because of their crew and shit, how they kind of carry themselves. But for the most part, most people who go to clubs are quite young. So then you're, you're trying to impress kids at like, what, 22, when you're like 35 plus that you go out clubbing and you go hard by posting pictures of yourself with your boys again no girls involved just you and the lads <laughs> with your IV drips and it's just a little bit I don't know it just comes across lame I don't know what it is about it I just think it looks a little bit lame maybe it's me hating because I'm not there and I want to be part of it and I want to be there as a hanger on rolling up the weed pouring someone's drink wiping their ass <laughs> racking up their lines for them you know what I mean maybe I want to be that person doing that but I don't think it's, that's the case I just think it just looks a little bit lame it just looks really hardcore lame and I think me personally I prefer having the real life kind of private nature of clubbing kept to myself there are some videos are uploaded and compilations whatnot, but why I actually get up to and what I'm like and what I'm doing when I'm out there it doesn't need to be documented I don't need to have like pictures of me recovering and shit I find all that stuff kind of crappy I do know there's a period of time in my life where when do you remember when we used to upload stuff on uh on facebook via like mobile uploads and stuff and people used to just upload many things this before maybe instagram was maybe as popular as it is i don't know whenever there was a period of time where facebook was popping and, and i used to myself upload many many pictures of myself out and about via mobile uploads and i'd upload like hundreds right i'd upload fucking me walking down the street blurry picture of my feet moving a uh, picture of me opening a door a post office picture of me eating a flipping baguette it's whatever nonsense shit either of me having a picture of me having a pint picture of me having a jaeger shot picture of me having whatever nonsense shit and i used to like sharing that because i felt like it was a good way to kind of catalog and sort of like share my day-to-day -day shit but then looking back and i remember at the time it felt a bit lame because like oh wow you drink wow i'm i drink alcohol so cool so edgy right i wear cool trainers so cool so edgy i have cool pants so cool so it kind of came across a bit lame and i just stopped myself i remember catching myself thinking what are you doing like who are you trying to impress that you go out on a friday night everyone that goes on a friday night you drink a pint of beer everyone drinks a pint of beer it's not that impressive um so sometimes i feel like this sort of like oh we, we went so hard we have to do iv drips or stuff it's like some people out there don't even have the benefit of having iv drips they go back to working a full-time job the day of day after i've done it many a time um you know surviving on on nothing short of maybe uh flipping a uh, filter coffee from pret-a-manger and a flipping um egg sandwich rolls or sort of breakfast roll type of thing uh, or sometimes not even that since i've just have egg mcmuffin from flipping mcdonald's and they keep it moving so this kind of boasting of the whole iv drip thing is just a little bit meh, redacted because again it's not cheap 
Do you know I mean, it's something that you also have to pay for because you have to get these guys to kind of come out to your compound or whatnot and administer this shit to you. But I don't know. I find it really lame. This is just my opinion. Maybe I'm I'm kind of being, um, you know, nitpicky about it. But I just find it incredibly reductive that you would share something like this and think it kind of makes you look cool. Don't get me wrong. The view behind them is sensational. Wherever they are. Um, in I guess the there in Ibiza in a place called the Beach Caves that looks absolutely phenomenal. But the sitting down with your friends, uh, it's funny enough. One of the guys there is a flipping Gracie black belt. Uh, he's actually part of the Gracie family in terms of jujitsu. That's kind of funny. But you know, sitting down there with your friends, posted up with your little ivy drips, just looks a little bit r worded to me personally. But the the location itself where they're at is absolutely phenomenal. I'm assuming they probably got invited there. It's all probably been comped out or the interior design. Whoa, come on. They've got an inbuilt studio in there too. Of course they have. It's IP for why wouldn't they have a studio in there? Oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Got to press a like on that one and favorite so I can come back later. But yeah, this is incredible to see. This Beach Caves IB for place is pretty cool. I, this is the one place I still haven't been at. Sure, is that Fasarazi? No, it's not. It's not a place. Um, this is the one place I still haven't been. I still haven't been to IB for. One of the main things I haven't actually visited, um, I actually need to go and check out, especially as a as somebody who's really into clubbing and shit. It's definitely a place that I should probably be checking out in it. But yeah, I believe it looks fucking cool. But God Almighty, man, this location was absolutely phenomenal. So yeah, big up him, I guess, isn't it? Living the life, doing your thing. Don't listen to me. Moving on quickly, we're going to talk about these courtesy of Over Under, and it's regarding the Nocta and Nike Air Force One certified lover boy Air Force Ones. Now, I don't personally understand why these took so long to come out because you would imagine part of the reason why you put these shoes together after you name your album Certified Lover Boy, which is, I feel like, oh, sorry, mixtape, whatever it was, um, I feel like it was one of the greatest titles you can put together for a project because it was essentially it would have been nice if he would have done it uh, if it would have been a quintessential r&b album like super soft super mopey um sort of album or maybe like a celebration of fuck boys and stuff because certified lover boy is amazing because back in the day you know if you were like a little bit of a rico suave type or if you were just mixed race and girls liked you people would sometimes call you lover boy right um um, whatever it may be so it's a term that i've kind of heard banded around and stuff so it's quite a funny um sort of title to name your album so it would have been nice to sort of have the the air force ones tie in with it because you know air force ones are sort of like the the flipping manolo blanick um of flipping shoes when it comes to guys in terms of upgrading your outfit and making you look like an absolute star it's you know everyone would love a pair of fresh white air force one for a first date with somebody that they really like it's definitely something that you would appeal to but for some reason there was rumors that are put out there that Nike were having some issues in terms of manufacturing this one little key detail in the certified lover boy Air Force Ones that's much different to other Air Force Ones that they put together. Well, maybe two. The first one being that on the side of the midsole where usually you have the air written on the side of the midsole of the Air Force One, they've changed it to say lover, was it not to say uh, love you forever? So I saw a lover boy. And then most importantly, on the back heel tab, on the back heel section of the Air Force One and towards the front of the tip of the Air Force One where there usually are these little star motifs, they've all these little star uh, bumps all over the place. They've, they've swapped that and made them into hearts. Now, they're not the most easily discernible hearts. They mostly look like triangles with a little bump in them. But they don't really look heart-shaped. They're a little bit weird. Supposedly, these were the really hard things for Nike to manufacture because, you know, I'm assuming they probably had to invent or create an entire new tooling to make that outsole itself especially to make the out maybe not just the outsole itself they had to create an entire new tooling to kind of put that together and if there's one thing you know about nike when it comes to putting more effort into re reimagining or reworking old classics they don't want to do it they're one of the most resting on the laurel brands out there there's a whole library of amazing vintage products that they have in their museum in their archives that they could es essentially bring back from the dead and reverse engineer and put out in the exact specifications of how they came out back in the day maybe with some upgrades and materials and maybe whatever it may be but they don't do it instead they create or put out really crappy um halfway done retros that don't really go anywhere and for the most part that's why they kind of stuck on just with their legacy shoes and shit but there's so many other things that they could pull out from their archive but they don't because they don't want to go through the hassle of retooling shit and i'm only saying it because i was told this many times by people who are in the know like why 
can't they just make a good standard or good quality Air Max Lite retro when it came out? Why was the Air Stab look so wonky? Um, why was the structure looking so wonky? Um, why even the Air Max One before they, all the updates they've made now? Why was it looking so crap for a long time? Why doesn't the Air Max Ninety look as good as the ones that came out in the nineties or early two thousands? And most of the reason why is because they don't have the tooling that they made the molds of those shoes back in the day now they don't have them available and for some reason they don't want to make them again because it's really expensive to make tooling for shoes i guess but if you're a multi-billion dollar company like nike and you're you know and you essentially are, you know who knows what they make from air force ones alone on a yearly basis how you can't just offset that cost and redo the tooling and then sell it to sneakerheads for an exorbitant price i don't know because i know i'd buy it if they made a air max 90 on air max one big window that was like to spec it was exactly how it did when it came out in 87 and they put that out there and told me it was 250 or 300 or 400 i'd buy it in a heartbeat but they don't they put out half baked their retros and whatever anyway that was a rumor that they put out there and then luckily now it looks like they're counteracting the rumor by saying no it is going to come out with the hearts on it because effectively if it doesn't come out of hearts on it what's the point of putting them out part of the reason why they looked incredible is because essentially they're an all-white air force one classic but they've got this um what you call what do they call this lever again i forgot the name of it um tumble is it tumbled leather i think it's tumbled leather which is a really lush soft plum leather that kind of doesn't really crease up but sort of like soaks into your foot a bit i don't know how to describe it it looks really nice so they've got this really nice leather on the upper they've got this great um you know just solid white color no off whites on the midsole or anything and um, it looks like a leather insole which i'm not the biggest fan of because sometimes it kind of gets a bit sweaty and slippy in there in general for me personally it's not something that i've kind of always been down with but essentially a classic all white upper um no real other extra details included and they've got the classic little nice added touch of having the love you forever and on the side of the midsole and then the heart shapes towards the back and the front of the outsole and then they've got these extra details which i have want no parts of which basically feature um I'm guessing it spells out Drake's name, maybe it says certified lover boy, these little kind of charm things I guess you're meant to put through your laces and whatnot, but that's that's another level of lover boy to have these little dangly things hanging off your laces and whatnot and making sounds as you walk. Definitely not something that I want. But according to Over Under, they're saying that these are meant to come out soon and they're priced at $160. And these are official images. So it's looking like these are probably gonna end up coming out, which I'm a fan of and I'm gonna try to get a pair. Is that mid? Is that insole? Am I right in saying that inner is leather? It isn't it? Yes, yeah, too sheer. Yeah. I don't like. It. I'm really not a fan of um, leather inners or whatnot. Even the silky ones. I think they should just be kept mesh so your feet can actually breathe. Oh, and the nice thing, addition at the back of the hill tab, they've got Nike Air written on the back of the hill, and then they've got here the Nocta sign with the three crucifix type um, symbols or whatnot, wherever they are, swords. I'm not too sure. I, wonder what, I don't even know what Doctor actually means to be completely honest and the insoles are just pretty plain it's sort of like a baby blue type but that might be his kind of signature colour in it that baby blue sort of like sky blue coral type colour whatever it may be called but yeah they look fairly decent man I'm really a big fan of them and they're meant to be coming out soon the Nocta Nike Air Force One Low Certified Lover Boys Quick news here to update you regarding something I spoke about on my podcast recently regarding Tower Hamlets and their ban um, concerning um, nudity, which obviously affected a lot of the kink and sex positive parties that happen in Tower Hamlets. Some of them I've, I've obviously been to um, and some of them I haven't been to, but I think the main ones that they were speaking about was Club club of a boat i forgot even that's the name club something um crossbreed and another one i forgot the name but those three were basically the main ones are basically trying to protest against this new restriction um in licensing and just to basically allow them to be able to put on these events in this place because it's something that they've obviously built and cultivated and uh especially the, the venue owners like e1 were really stepping up and really basically saying that they want these people to stay and put events on their spaces because essentially they're essentially keeping the lights on there so all these things are really important and then good news here concerning mix mag it says tower hamlets have to remove the nudity restrictions licensing condition following save the kinks spaces protest which is great to see because usually i feel like these protests and these petitions don't do anything and i know that's not the right way to think but they usually don't do anything but it's great to see that for once 
protesting, petitioning, talking about it online and whatnot, and just kind of making your voice heard actually does make a change. And especially in London, when, you know, I, sp read, I said already, um, one in five clubs are closing and we have less clubs than we've ever had before. And things are really on a downward turn, it feels like. And obviously the news with print works and the course finding hard to find a new location, all these kind of things are happening. It's nice to see we have a little bit of a light in the tunnel and we have one win at least we can kind of put our hat on and obviously here's an article courtesy of mix mag that talks about it. it says as follows tower hamlets council has removed restrictive clause in its licensing term that prohibited full nudity in nightlife venues following a protest from queer nightlife groups the decision comes following a hearing last week on tuesday 26th of july over the licensing terms of east london venue e1 studio spaces um proposing an end to, to semi-nudity within the club the venue is home to a number of queer parties including kink friendly Crossbreed, Club Verboten and later whom were contacted by Tyre Hamlet's Council in March requesting that a prohibited nudity to try to limit nudity. Now, if you're not familiar with the London scene, these two parties, Crossbreed and Club Verboten, absolutely run the kink scene. There are a few others that exist out there too that are doing their thing, but in terms of being the main spearheads and the, at the forefront of shit, they're absolutely leading the charge. So if these two guys weren't able to put on events and do what they needed to do, that that would have like a real ripple effect on the entire scene going forward and then it would drive shit underground, which I don't think makes it completely the safest place to be. But still, you know, at least they're around. But the fact that there are these legit, kind of like you know um by the book events and it's also the underground stuff makes a scene much healthier i feel like when everything is underground it makes it far more of a dangerous place and an easy place for the authorities to come in and start saying oh you're doing bad things but when we have legit things going on and we have stuff on the underground we have a more co cohesive whatever it may be called what's that word called we have a more um, harmonious scene I feel like it continues following the complaint a hearing was set for July over the future of E1 with fears for many within the queer and king's communities that ruling could have knock on effect on the rest of the borough and London as a whole the funny thing that people don't actually realize about E1 regardless if you're into kink or not the lack of air conditioning in there is going to make you be semi-nude or maybe sometimes fully nude it's not the place that you go to in order to cover up. It's a place that you go to in order to kind of disrobe, right? Do you know what I mean? To to take off your garments. You don't go there to put on more garments or to be afraid of people not wearing garments. Everything is so warm in there, man. Organizers behind Club Verboten, um, organizers save the King Spaces protest outside the Tower Hamlet's Town Club town hall sorry during the hearing it's actually nice that the club nights come together also there's not like comp there's not like aggressive competition they kind of service different scenes different industry whatever same scene but they kind of service different people whatever they can live harmoniously that's good to see because back in the day when i used to promote there was none of this <clears throat> there's none of this um kumbaya that went on between promoters there's a lot of cutthroat shit anyway it continues organizer carver burton said um oh he's actually named he, he named the club night after himself that's fucking cojones, isn't it? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Big up Carl. Uh, he said in a statement to mix my head of the protest, the council is relying on outdated moralist views without a regard to the diversity and exclusivity in the nighttime economy. Tower Hammers Council is trying to force its judgmentalism on club... Co is that a word? Ju judgmentalism? Fuck. On club operators, promoters, and force them to police gender and sexuality on consenting adults. Yeah, that that thing that they said about semi-nudity and how you have to ask somebody's gender and ascertain what gender they are in terms of if they can take their top off was nuts. As part of the Save the Kink protest, hundreds of people in the queer kink and fetish communities descended on the Tower Hammers Town Hall in popular. Many tuned many sorry turned up in dressed in head to toe fetish wear some had brought along their dogs and some brandished signs reading slogans like sexual liberty under threat and bottoms or tops we're all hate cops oh i love that that's i want that that's that should be in a t-shirt and a hat in it that's a fucking great slogan in it bottoms or tops we all hate cops definitely agree as the hearing began the crowd watched on a small screen from the from the hall's exterior taking uh, quietly taking time to cheer as a banister leo what's that Charlem Char Chara Lambids Leo Chara Lambids who was representing the appeal of E1's behalf read out statements in defense of the venue and the wider community it says as follows this is one statement 
I joined Club Verboten at the end of last year and it was the best club I've ever been to. One attendee at the said the King protest told Mix Mac to be around sexually open-minded people made me so happy. Being in a safe environment is one of the best things you can do. There's no harm being done whatsoever, especially con compared to normal clubs where more harm is happening. It's definitely true. Even though there was a cases of sexual assault happening in some of these venues, it's still amazing how less how the numbers are so low sometimes incredibly now nil point considering how what people are dressed like considering the monarchy that it's after you know it's under and considering what time people are on in there do you know what i mean people just behave and know what to do and how to respect each other which is flipping incredible to see to be honest and they essentially police themselves with no real external help needed they should you know what i mean they that, that should be a case study that should be kind of implemented in other commercial high street type of clubs because there's something they're doing that definitely those guys aren't it continues another attendee who made um sorry who moved to south london why am i seeing words that are, are not there another attendee who moved to london from berlin lambasted the city's lack of understanding of sex positive culture he's this person said i see a lot of security a lot of control there isn't a there's there isn't a lot of agency for venue owners for those throwing parties or guests to create their own spaces more trash will be good for the city of london to create spaces welcome to london whoever you are welcome to london we don't have there is no such thing as um uh or, or what you call it personal authority or ownership there is no such thing as personal agency it doesn't exist here in london um they don't treat you as adults they treat everybody like a child effectively we're very anti-fun in the uk and in london um yeah that's just the nature of the beast isn't it like i said one of the only places in the world where you have security guards with flashlights on the dance floor making sure you're not doing anything naughty maybe they have them in commercial clubs in ibiza too i've seen that a uh, be a thing where it's a little bit of a hustle where they'll go on the dance floor flash their lights in on you just as about to take the bump threaten to throw you out but then if you offer them 50 euros they, 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 they'll let you stay in <laughs> and it continues Tahamas is now the most progressive council around in actively acknowledging and supporting the existence of kinksters it's the first step towards working collectively on creating a safer space with local communities and for it that's really cool but again they keep this off to themselves they're not harming anybody most of these events are at night time or during days when no kids are around why don't just let them do their own thing anyway I don't understand why this has to include the community anyway just let them exist you know maybe give them a code of conduct or whatnot they have to abide by maybe a free strike rule I don't know whatever it may be but let them kind of do their own thing because they're already doing it pretty successfully without the intrusion of these government officials but anyway it continues it took three years longer than we've hoped for but we are super grateful for the committee for taking the time to understand the people of our community free of stigma London Knights are Amy Lammy. Oh, fuck you, Amy Lammy. You had nothing to do with this, you fucking idiot. Celebrates it. Great news. I'm thrilled that you want a success with the removal of the restrictions of the venue. Can once again diverse result. Oh, I've got, I've got, I've got, to, I've got to flip in, retweet this and say, you had nothing to do with this. Why are you? Oh, my God. Clout chaser. You had absolutely nothing to do with this. Let's do it. Clout chaser. What a clout chaser. What a clout chaser. Let's, let's, let's write that. What a clout chaser you had absolutely nothing to do with this <laughs> still <laughs> smh <laughs> smh get out of here man anyone said the same thing to me as, as in the comments or not or am i just the only person that said it maybe the only person that said it who soon knows amazing news thank you for your help Oh, of course they're gonna say that in it. But anyway, regardless, a victory anyway. Let me not kind of dally and sully this thing. Uh, big up everybody that went to the protest for the Save Our, Save King Spaces protest. Tower hand bullets have effectively rescinded, which is something I don't usually see or step back or you know whatever it may be. And it's good to see and hopefully going forward we see more of these events happening and we see the community grow and grow and grow in the coming years. Grow and bloody grow. Anyway, that has been the Excellent Zing Show episode number 592, I think. If it's your first time, check out the show. Thank you for checking me out. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If you want to check out more stuff concerning me, you'll find the links in the description. And if it's your first time checking myself out on the old YouTube, make sure you subscribe. If you listen via podcast app, then please leave me a five-star review on all the podcasting platforms such as Spotify and Apple iTunes. I'd be greatly appreciated to see that. But until next time, my friends, I'll see you again very, very soon. Take care. And of course, as per usual, be safe. 
And of course, before we end, if you listen via the audio platform, you'll obviously hear my tune of the day. And if you're watching this via YouTube, unfortunately, it will just fade to black. But thanks anyway for attending. Thank you so much for checking me out. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace.